The arrival of The Big Short in theaters a few weeks ago and its subsequent win at the 88th Academy Awards has reignited interest in the causes of the 2008 financial crisis. The whole housing market is propped up on these bad loans. The film would have you think that private greed on Wall Street and a lack of regulation caused the economic crash. This is a story that is simple to describe and easy to believe. The government likes it because it places most of the blame on the private sector. I'm sure the world's banks have more incentives than greed. You're wrong. And Hollywood likes it because it is easy to blame human foibles, like greed, as a source of much more complicated problems. But while stories like this might make for a fun movie, the big short fails to align with the facts. The reality is that government housing policies led to a general deterioration in all mortgage underwriting standards, to the mortgage meltdown of 2007 and 2008, and ultimately to the market crash that we know as the 2008 financial crisis. To get an accurate perspective on what led to the financial crash, we have to wind back the clock to 1992. Despite many government subsidies, the home ownership rate in the United States had been stalled at 64% for 30 years. Congress blamed this on two government-sponsored enterprises, or GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These GSEs had government backing, but were also private profit-making firms and insisted on acquiring only prime mortgages. Thus, it was argued, by insisting on these underwriting standards, the GSEs left a vast number of low-income Americans frozen out of the American dream of home ownership. So in 1992, Congress adopted a program known as the Affordable Housing Goals, which required Fannie and Freddie to acquire an annual quota of mortgages that had been made to low or moderate income borrowers without considering whether the mortgages were prime loans. Starting in 1993, 30% of all loans that the GSEs acquired in any year had to be made to home buyers who were at or below the median income where they lived. But the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, was given authority to raise the goals, and it did, aggressively. Between 1993 and 2000, HUD raised the 30% goals to 50%, and between 2001 and 2008, it raised the goals to 56%. Thus, by 2008, 56% of all mortgages the GSEs acquired had to be made to borrowers below the median income of their communities. Notably, HUD's relentlessly rising quotas occurred in both Democratic and Republican administrations. Understandably, it was difficult for the GSEs to meet these quotas and still acquire only prime loans. Accordingly, between 1993 and 2008, they began to accept increasing numbers of non-prime and other risky mortgages with low or no down payments and from borrowers with poor credit ratings. By June 2008, before the financial crisis, more than half of all mortgages in the United States, 31 million loans, were subprime or otherwise risky, and 76% of these loans were on the books of various government agencies, primarily Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. The connection between the dramatic rise in subprime mortgages and the financial crisis is clear. Because the government-backed GSEs dominated the mortgage market, when they reduced their underwriting standards to meet the affordable housing quotas, the rest of the market followed. Soon, borrowers who could have afforded prime mortgages were getting loans with zero down payments. This created an enormous housing price bubble. It is easy to see why. If a buyer has $10,000 to buy a home, and the down payment required is 10%, he can buy a $100,000 home. But if the down payment requirement is reduced to 5%, the same buyer can buy a $200,000 home. He borrows $190,000 instead of $90,000. This put great upward pressure on home prices, causing the bubble. Also, the buyer now has less investment in the home and more debt to repay. So when the bubble began to deflate in 2007, borrowers found that they owed more than their homes were worth. Many of them simply walked away from the home. Others tried to get lower cost financing, but could not. The number of defaults was unprecedented. 
Fannie later reported that in 2008, it was exposed to $878 billion in subprime and other risky mortgages, which caused 81% of its losses that year. Freddie's percentage exposures and losses were proportionately the same. Both organizations were taken over by the government by the end of that year. Government blunders then turned the mortgage meltdown into a financial crisis. First, the government rescued Bear Stearns, a Wall Street investment bank, in March 2008, creating expectations that it would rescue other big firms if they got into trouble. But when Lehman Brothers, a firm much larger than Bear, weakened, the government suddenly reversed its policy, letting Lehman Brothers fail. This upended the market's expectations, creating doubt about the safety and soundness of every firm. The result was an unprecedented panic that we know today as the financial crisis. Long story short, was there bad behavior on Wall Street? Of course, there have always been individuals who take advantage of the system. But that's not the issue here. The 2008 financial crisis was not caused by Wall Street fat cats taking advantage of loopholes due to a lack of regulations. They were taking advantage of market conditions that existed because of irresponsible government regulations.